I guess if you go to Paris and you see the perfect dress, is that, well, the runway has led to an absolute beautiful place. I would like to uh, welcome all of you, thank you again, and I'd like to read a few words from Thornton Wilder to get us in the mood. Whatever, we're going to hear a lot about the office and more about it. Viewed is, is a view, and I'll probably correct if somebody makes a mistake. You know, I don't know if that's wrong. Or something, I don't know. We're going to have an awful good time today. Uh, but one thing is, he, he wanted it to be entertaining and coming. And I'd like to read in the cast out as the spirit of the afternoon something that he wrote about another work that applies to all of his work. He wrote it about the matchmaker. So many people now know as the musical Hello Dolly, but you see the read the play. <laughs> he wrote this, but it, it relates to his uh, his understanding of art and and uh, and what he believed in human humanity. Enough for me. The gift to the public of laughter without malice is one of the most useful things a man can do. Anyone can make a comedy that is, that is cruel. It is hard to make a comedy that is kind, to give a feeling, to give a fellow a feeling between the young and the old. That is art. And I want to read it because I think it also applies directly to the subject this evening, the office norm. Thank you for coming. Narragansett Bay. Now, during my 
three hours, I had taken many long walks over the region. I had come to love the town, the bay, the sea, the weather, the night sky. I knew only one family there, hospitable friends who had heeded the injunction to invite a serviceman to Sunday dinner. And I had received a favorable impression of the townspeople. Now, on seeing the sign, an idea occurred to me as to how I might earn my daily expenses with a part-time activity without drawing on my own savings. Oh, what a day. What promises of a still retarded spring. What intimations that I was approaching the salt sea. Hannah behaved pretty well until we got within the city limits when she started coughing and staggering. We persevered and reached Washington Square, where I stopped to inquire the location of the Young Men's Christian Association. Not the Army and Navy Y, right before me, but the civilian Y. I entered a store selling newspapers, postcards, etc., and telephoned the Y, asking if there was a room available. I added buoyantly that I was under 30, had been christened in the First Congregational Church in Madison, Wisconsin, and that I was fairly sociable. A weary voice replied, yeah, That's all right, buddy, calm down. 50 cents a night. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah objected to going further, but was persuaded to enter Thames Street. I brought her to a stop at Josiah Dexter's Garage with papers. A mechanic examined her long and thoughtfully and uttered some words that were unintelligible to me. Uh, how much would that cost? Ah, uh, fifteen dollars, looks like. Do you buy old cars? Yeah. <laughs> My brother does. Hey, Josiah! Josiah! Jalopy for sale! <laughs> now, this was in 1926, when all mechanics, electricians, and plumbers were not only reliable, but were held in high esteem as props of the self-respecting household. Josiah Dexter was much older than his brother. He had one of those faces that one sees now only in daguerreotypes of judges and parsons. He too examined the car, and they conferred together. I said, I'll sell you the car for twenty dollars if you drive me and my luggage to the Y. Josiah Dexter said, Agreed. We transferred my luggage into his car, and I was about to climb in when I said, wait a minute. The air made me giddy. I was about a mile from where I had spent part of my 20th and 21st years. I turned back to Hannah and stroked her hood. Goodbye, Hannah, I said. No hard feelings on either side. See what I mean? Then I whispered into her nearest headlight, Old age and death come to all. <laughs> Even the weariest river winds its way to the sea. As Goethe said, Walda Wulhes du auch. Then I took my place beside Mr. Dexter. He drove a block slowly and, and then said, You had that car long? I had been the owner of that car for one hour and twenty minutes. <laughs> Another block. Do you get worked up about everything you own? <laughs> Mr. Dexter, I was stationed at Fort Adams during the war. I'm back here. I've now been in Newport for a quarter of an hour. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful place. I'm a little lightheaded. Sadness is just around the corner from happiness. May I ask what it was you said to the court? I repeated what I had said, translated the German ending. Soon you too will rest. <laughs> Those are commonplace remarks, Mr. Dexter, but I have come to see lately that if we shrink from platitudes, platitudes will shrink from us. I never sneer at the poems of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who spent so many happy weeks in and near Newport. I know that. Can you give me the address of an establishment that rents bicycles? I do. Then I shall be at your garage in an hour to hire one. Mr. Decker, I hope my lightheadedness has not offended you. No, we New Englanders don't go in for lightheadedness much. <laughs> but I've heard nothing to be offended at. That German said again. In a poem, he was talking to himself late at night in a tower room 
a deep forest all around him. He wrote them with a diamond on a window pane. They are the last words of the most famous poem in the German language. He was in his 20s. He got his rest at 85. We had reached the entrance to the Y. He stopped the car and remained still a moment, his hand on the wheel. He said, I lost my wife five weeks ago tomorrow. She got a lot of Longfellow's poetry. He helped me carry my baggage into the hall. He put a $20 bill in my hand, nodded slightly, saying, Good day to you, and left the building. Mr. Josiah Dexter was not in his garage an hour later, but his brother helped me select a wheel, as we generally called them in those days. I continued down Thames Street and set out on the 10-mile drive. I rode past the entrance of Fort Adams. Corporal North, Chief, President, sir. And then the Agassiz House. Seldom has so great a wealth of learning been so lightly born. And drew up at the sea wall before the Budlong House. The wind in my face. I gazed across the glittering sea toward Portugal. I did not complete the ten miles of the famous drive, but returned to town by a shortcut. I wanted to walk some of the streets I had walked so often during my first day in the city. In particular, I wanted to see again the buildings of my favorite age, the 18th century church, town hall, and mansions and to gaze again at the glorious trees of Newport, lofty, sheltering, and fair. The climate, but not the soil, of Eastern Rhode Island was favorable to the growth of large and exotic trees. It was explained that a whole generation of learned scientists had derived pleasure from planting foreign trees on this aquidnic island, and that thereafter, a generation of yachtsmen had vied with one another in bringing here examples from far places. Much labor had been involved, caravans of wagons bringing soil from the interior. I was to discover later that many residents did not know the names of the trees that beautified their property. Well, we think that that's a banyan or, or a beetle nut tree. Uh, <laughs> I think grandfather said that one was from uh, Patagonia, from Ceylon, <laughs> Japan. <laughs> one of my discarded ambitions had been to be an archaeologist. I had even spent the large part of a year in Rome studying its methods and progress there. But long before, like many other boys, I had been enthralled by the great Schliemann's discovery of the site of ancient Troy. Those nine cities, one on top of the other. In the four and a half months that I'm about to describe, I found, or thought I found, that Newport, Rhode Island presented nine cities. Some superimposed, some having very little relation with the others, variously beautiful, impressive, absurd, commonplace, and one very nearly squalid. The first city exhibits the vestiges of the earliest settlers, a 17th century village containing the famous stone round tower, the subject of Longfellow's poem, The Skeleton in Armor. Long believed to have been a relic of the roving Vikings, now generally thought to have been a mill built by the father or grandfather of Benedict Arnold. The second city <coughs> is the 18th century town, containing some of the most beautiful public and private edifices in America. It was this town which played so important a part in the War of Independence, and from which the enthusiastic and generous French friends of our revolt under Rochambeau and Washington launched the sea campaign that successfully turned the course of the war. The third city contains what remains of one of New England's most prosperous seaports, surviving into the 20th century on the bay side of Thames Street, with its wharfs and docks and Chandler's establishment, redolent of tar and oakum, with glimpses of drying nets and sails under repair, now largely dependent on the yachts and pleasure boats moored in the harbor. Recalled above all, by a series of bars and taverns of a particular squalor dear to seamen, into which a land lover seldom ventured twice. <laughs> the fourth city belonged to the army and the navy. There has all long been a system of forts defending Narragansett Bay. The naval base and training station had grown to a great size during the war, a world apart. The fifth city 
was inhabited since early in the 19th century by a small number of highly intellectual families from New York and Cambridge and Providence who had discovered the beauties of Newport as a summer resort. Few Bostonians visited it. They had their North Shore and South Shore resorts. Henry James, the Swedenborgian philosopher, brought his family here, including the young philosopher and the young novelist. In his last unfinished novel, Henry James Jr. returns in memory and sets the scene of the ivory tower among the houses and lawns edged by the cliff walk. Here lived to a great age Julia Ward Howe, author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. There was a cluster of Harvard, excuse me, there was a cluster of Harvard professors. The house of John Lewis Rudolph Agassiz that I had just passed was converted into a hotel and is still one in 1972. At a later visit, I was able to engage the pentagonal room in a turret above the house. From that magical room, I could see at night the beacons of six lighthouses and hear the booming or chiming of as many sea buoys. Then to make the sixth city came the very rich, the empire builders, many of them from their castles on the Hudson and their villas in Saratoga Springs, suddenly awakens to the realization that inland New York State is crushingly hot in summer. <laughs> and with them came fashion, competitive display, and the warming satisfaction of exclusion. This so-called great age was long over, but much remained. In a great city, the vast army of servants merges into the population. But on a small island, and a small part of that island, the servants constitute a seventh city. Those who never enter the front door of the house in which they live except to wash it, become conscious of their indispensable role and develop a sort of underground solidarity. The eighth city, dependent like the seventh on the sixth, contains the population of camp followers and parasites, prying journalists, detectives, fortune hunters, <laughs> crashers, half-cracked aspirants to social prominence, seers, healers, equivocal protege and protégés. Wonderful material for my journal. <laughs> Finally, there was, and is, and long will be, the Ninth City, the American middle-class town buying and selling, raising its children and burying the dead, with little attention to spare for the eight cities so close to it. I watched and recorded them. I came to think of myself as Gulliver on the island of Aquidnick. <laughs> on the morning following my arrival, I called for advice on a person with whom I dared to presume I had a remote connection, William Wentworth, superintendent at the casino. Now, ten years before this, my brother, while still an undergraduate at Yale, had played there in the New England Tennis Championship Tournament and had won high place. He had told me of Mr. Wentworth's congeniality and ever-ready helpfulness. He first strolled through the entrance and surveyed the playing area and the arrangement for spectators. The building was designed, as were other edifices in Newport, by the brilliant and ill-fated Stanford White. As in every work from his hand, it was marked by distinguished design and a free play of fancy. Although it was early in the spring, the famous lawn courts were already a carpet of green. I knocked on the superintendent's door and was bidden to enter by a hale man of 50 who put out his hand, saying, Oh, good morning, sir. Sit down. What can I do for you? I told him of my brother's past in the tournament. <clears throat> oh, well, let me see now. 1960. Here's his picture, and here's his name on the annual cup. I remember him well, a fine fellow and a top-ranking player. Where is he now? He's in the ministry. Oh, fine. He said, well, I told him of my military service at Fort Adams. I told him of my four years in uninterrupted teaching, of my need for a change, and of a less demanding teaching schedule. I showed him the sketch for an advertisement I planned to put in the newspaper and asked him if he'd be kind enough to tap a copy on the casino's bulletin board. He read it. And not. Mm. Now, Mr. North, it's early in the season, but we always have young people home for one reason or another who need tutoring. Now, generally, they call on the masters from the nearby schools, but those masters don't like to give the time as their turn approaches. Well, 
You'll get some of their pupils, I hope. But we have another group that might be eager for your services. Would you be ready to read aloud to older people with poor eyesight? Uh, yes, I would, Mr. Weber. Oh, well, everybody calls me Bill. I call every man over 16 Mr. <laughs> Do you play tennis, too? Oh, not as well as my brother, of course, but I passed out my boyhood in uh, California, and everyone plays it there. Do you think you could coach children from 8 to 18? I was pretty uh, intensively coached myself. I'll start collecting a class for you. One dollar an hour for each youngster. You could ask two dollars an hour to reading aloud. The kindness is not uncommon. But imaginative kindness can give a man a shock. I could be occasionally altruistic myself, but as a form of play, it is easier to give than to receive. Now, throughout the summer, Theophilus would appear to give far more than he receives in a variety of jobs to people of all ages, backgrounds, incomes, and needs in all nine cities. But when the summer comes to an end and the focus is on the servant's ball, Theophilus reveals how Newport has enriched his own life. For some weeks, I had felt the intimations of autumn in the air. Some of the leaves of Newport's glorious trees were changing color and falling. I found myself murmuring the words of Glaucus in the Iliad. Even as are the generations of leaves, so are those of men. The wind scatters the leaves on the earth, and the forest buds put forth more when spring comes around. So are the generations of men. One puts forth, and another ceases. The summer of 1926 was coming to an end. I had called at Mr. Dexter's garage and had paid the two final installments on my bicycle, up to and including the last day of my stay. In addition, I had bought from him a jalopy at a price somewhat higher than I had paid for hard hearted men, who in the meantime had been restored to further usefulness and was watching this transaction. <laughs> I own the user myself, <laughs> said Mr. Dexter. I know what to do. Uh, did you uh, want to say a few words to her? <laughs> <laughs> no, Mr. Dexter, I am not so light uh, lightheaded as I was. I heard you had some troubles. <clears throat> Everything gets around in Newport. Yes. <laughs> True or false, it gets around. <laughs> Mr. North, before I shake your hand, I have a confession to make. Huh? I buy old cars, as you know. My young brother cleans them up. Some weeks we get four or five. He's a careless soul. He dumps old things he finds under the seats and the linings under the rug, all kinds of things, in a barrel, you know, for me to sift out later. Sometimes I don't get to look at it for weeks. Now, about six weeks ago, I found a sort of store with no name on it, no place mentioned except Trenton, New Jersey. And the license on your car was New Hampshire. And after talking to you tonight, I think that that story was by you. I had turned scarlet. He reached down to a lower drawer in his desk and pulled out a long entry from my journal. The account of an adventure I'd had with a shoemaker's daughter in Trenton. <laughs> I nodded and he handed it over to me. Will you accept my apology, Mr. Oh, it's of no importance, just some scribbling to pass the time. <laughs> and we looked at each other in silence. <laughs> you made what happened pretty vivid, Mr. North. <laughs> I'd say you had a knack for that kind of thing. <laughs> you ever thought about being a writer? I should have been. I'll see you down here, call. <laughs> Good night, Josiah, and thank you. Drive carefully, the office. I didn't wait under the trees outside Mrs. Venable's cottage to hear the Sousa march and the blue Danube waltz. Imagination draws on memory. Memory and imagination combined can stage a servant's ball or even write a book, if that's what they want to do.
of Newport's urban plan, but something that you might not know about John is he is also a writer of fiction. <laughs> and he has come out with a book with an engaging title, which I will let John tell you. What is that title? Gods and Girls, <laughs> Tales of Art, Seduction, and Obsession. <laughs> now, do you not think that is going to be a bestseller? <laughs> and then we have Daniel, Dan Titus, and he is our new corner through many generations. For those of us at Salve, he is our wizard guru, the techie who always saves us when we are having issues. But some of you may not know that he is also an inveterate collector, not hoarder, but <laughs> And one, uh, one of his remarkable, remarkable uh, collections are these vintage images, postcards of Newport. And he has donated how many images to the Saudi Library? How many? Five thousand. <laughs> Which will, at some point, be available uh, for us to uh, access. And then, Tappy Wilder, Tappy, uh, as we call him, Gordon Snapple. And what Tappy has done, uh, many, many things. But he has worked, I think, just absolutely tirelessly and done this Leviathan job of expanding and enriching and preserving his uncle's legacy. And if you were to go down to the Beinecke down at Yale, I forget how many, um, <laughs> Christopher Buckley said, how many, I don't know, how many linear yards there are. But uh, it is a paradise for any of you uh, who wish to do research. But the other thing that I would also like to add is that Taffy is also a scholar, a wonderful writer, as you will discover when you read his new afterward in this reissuing of, of the author's norm. And the other thing I would also add, too, is that he is just so wonderfully generous to readers, scholars, truly, no exaggeration, around the world, just a wonderful resource uh, who will devote Vladimir's time to helping us out. Yes, he, he did say earlier, he will tell us if we're wrong, but he does it very politely and always with a sense of humor. So I turn now to our panel and we'll begin with uh, John. And we will be having a conversation back and forth, so this is not one of these rigid panels. Uh, and at the end, we invite you also uh, to offer comments and also to ask any questions uh, that you might have. So, thank you, and John. Well, I want to talk about the setting of the novel first. I'll create the setting for the stage. And I'm struck by the end of the novel when the word memory is used. And in my own writings, I often say Newport is a place of memory, which is embedded in the streets, urban spaces, and natural settings of the city. Memory tends to bring us only to the past, but I consider the place of continuing memory, because everyone who has encountered this place has interpreted it for themselves. And in the project we're working on at the Newport Historical Society, we are documenting the physical evolution of the city. That's factual, maps and such, and streetscapes. But we're also looking at the cultural response to Newport by artists, writers, etc., over time. And in many ways, it's those writers and artists who turn Newport or interpret Newport as a mythic place. And in my experience, a myth is just as important as a fact. <laughs> Oftentimes, it's the myth that draws us to a place, and then we go through the layers. I just have a few images that I want to Let's see. Oh, this is I do like this one statement, and you've heard plenty of quotes, but from Gordon Wilder, 
I found or thought I found that Newport, Rhode Island presented nine cities, some superimposed, some having very little relation to the other, with the others, variously beautiful, impressive, absurd, commonplace, and one very nearly squalid, as you've heard. When I started to look at Newport, you see these various interpretations like any work of art. If the city is the sum total of its parts, the 17th century foundation city, the 18th century seaport, the expanding Victorian city, the gilded city, the working city, the present heritage tourism city, the changing city. Uh, everyone has had a response to it, positive, negative. That's the beauty of the place. And let's just try to physically imprint on our minds what those <coughs> cities are. This is an early view of the city, 1740. A wind everything crowded along the waterfront, and spires of various houses of worship peppered through the town. Because, and Ruth mentioned this in her welcome, a church was never the center of this town because of the concept of freedom of conscience. And there's the map. There's the physical imprint of the 18th century city. The point on the lower left, established by the Society of Friends and Early Grid, the wards themselves, and this triangle at the, at the very top is the colony house. Newport's story is one of layering, and this is what strikes me about the Oculus story that sense of the nine cities, that sense of the layering of the town. But the actual physical growth of the city, I would call it expansion. Nothing was destroyed. It just kept growing and being layered. Well, the first image was from around 1777. This image is from 1878, under one years later. One of those grand civic views, these birds I shot, Notice the difference. It's not taken from the harbor. The view is of the cliffs of Upper Point. They were promoting Newport as a summer resort. It was the picturesque quality of the town that was so important. And it shows Bellevue Avenue established in the 1850s and then Ocean Drive established in the 1860s. So the summer resort looms, but the working waterfront is still very important, and the Navy will eventually grow. Then we have the place itself. This is a view of Washington Square, the ever-changing city, the layering. You see the 18th century house, uh, a federal period house, first on the right, an 18th century house, and then a Victorian bank on Washington Square. This ever-changing city, the layers begin to happen. As I said, with uh, Thornton Wilde feeling like Heinrich Schliemann, you know, slowly finding different levels of Troy. <coughs> this image, I think, is critical. This was a photograph taken in the early 1870s, commissioned by Charles Fallon McKim, the architect, of course, who had parked in Stanford White and William Rutherford Mead. But this is, an 18, this is the early 1870s, and the McKim portfolio of photographs of 18th century Newport is on deposit at the Newport Historical Society. It's a true gem. One of the photographs of Whitehall was the first ever published colonial building in 1874. But look what he's choosing to do. We're looking at the colony house where we are sitting, but it's, in, it's from that direction, that side, looking from both Barney Street, etc. And what he's capturing, what McKim is looking for, is the picturesque jumble of the old colonial town, which had fallen out of fashion. But all of a sudden, this romantic <coughs> revival, this new interest in the 18th century as the country is approaching its centre. 1876. And so it's this picturesque quality. Henry James also referred to it as this, sort of this fading gentility in the town. This is when, I feel, Newport, colonial Newport starts to become iconic and a seedbed of the colonial revival. And it's an entirely romantic notion. Do we have the, the other aspect of Newport? When one speaks of glorious trees, need I say more? Picture's worth a thousand words. This is Beaulieu, built in the uh, uh, mid to late 1850s, set in these verdant lawns, and Newport becomes this place of tree collecting. And when you walk through the town, you do think of the number of characters in town. And I'm talking about districts, not people. <laughs> people, of course. <laughs> but think of the difference between the tightly enclosed town, the expansive quality of the uh, uh, 19th century town. And this is an illustration from Punk magazine, a wonderful satirical magazine. And I feel in the way it captures 
some of what Thought Wilde was referring to, because in one image, you have the casino in the upper right, the fashionable world. You have the old 18th century city uh, with its Victorian buildings on the lower left. What I particularly love is the image in the center, two very fashionable ladies in their carriage driving by the slowly decaying 18th century town that uh, Charles Fallon McKim was so interested in. But Henry James was mentioned earlier, and he has a role in this as well. He's very famous for placing some of his scenes in Newport, but there's a passage in his um, American scenes, in his sense of Newport, this is 1907, where he talks about the area around the colony house, the building we're sitting in. And I paraphrase, but he said it reminded him of a Vanderheide, an old Dutch painting, an old Dutch town. So he's already creating this myth of ancientness about the old town. And he said, you know, one could sense the ghosts of French officers, of Lafayette. So I really feel one can combine McKim's photograph with Henry James' statement and already we have an appreciation of this. Now, the fashionable world is still booming, you know? Uh, this is Miss Edith Wetmore sitting at Chateau sur Mer in 1962. Now, many people think of the, the colonial town as still crumbling. Yes, it's true. However, if we think about the modern era, the post-World War II era, in 1944, Life magazine wrote an article, Life Visits a Fading Report. It called Great Offense Report. But all of a sudden, the preservation movement is catching up steam. But Miss Needham even reminds me, she may not have been a, ca a character in the office more, but it reminds me, here she's sitting in her mausoleum, her citadel against the future. The shadows are staring out at the world somewhat grimly. She was born in 1870. She died in 1966. Nancy Serp is a young photographer caught this at that very moment of looking into the future. No one knew it, but great change was upon us. Also, we sit at the epicenter of Newport. The spring is out there, one of the early sites of settlement. Washington Square, Long Wharf. But at the end of Long Wharf, was the site of one of the most convulsive moments in 1960s urban renewal, the creation of America's Scott Boulevard, which really almost, which destroyed that part of town. Again, we can say 95% of Newport is still historically intact, but this was the moment. And I've always taken that Theophilus uh, uh, Thornton Wilder is using Newport as a setting. He's placing it in 1926. And one can say by 1926, you had all of the characters of Newport's districts in place. Colonial, Victorian, Gilded Age, the working town, the upper Broadway area, the presence of the Navy. But he's in 1973, just when urban renewal was somewhat complete around 1972. Newport Bridge was already open. The bicentennial would happen in 1976, which would change the town. So he's seeing this, this sense of change. There's one other element, though. There's not just the physical space, there's emotional space. This is the Navy being entertained on the grounds of the Elms. So I see the town as this physical quality, the streets, the maps you see. But there's the personalities who come to this town and have to find it, whether it's artistic or social. So those are some of my ideas about the setting. But again, I think what's critical is Newport is a cultural place. There are the buildings and, and, the, and, and the place itself, but there's what I call the ever-changing interpretation. And I see from Wilder as picking up that mantle and creating a remarkable layered story that's both place and humanity. And as I reread the book, this is the fifth time I've read it, it became, I reinterpreted it with a, with a different viewpoint. So this is my take on it. Hit up and the comments and I'm not trying to stand over here. It's tough when you're tall because no one can see through you. <laughs> so we go forward here to the bottom of Wall Street. I have read the Theophilus book about every year since I was 13. And I'm about 26 now. <laughs> but I'm always fascinated by what he saw when he wrote his town in his job. And I'm going to go quick here for it is amazing how much actually still exists. Yes, a lot was destroyed, especially in the late 60s and early 70s with urban renewal. But even the 20s was a really interesting time, especially in this area of town. For Newport, a lot of buildings were going up. Newport has always had their share of fires, uh, especially in this area. Starting at the high school all the way down here, 
Um, so there has been quite a bit that was lost. But he would have rode into town, he would have seen in front of City Hall. This is about 1919, right at about the end of the war, when Fountain would have been stationed here in the military. Beautiful elm trees, there's a parade for victory, uh, right in front of City Hall, before the theaters are up. Right in the City Hall, a victim was fired. 1926, he would have been coming to town, they would have just been finishing what we see here. Uh, you ever seen pictures of the original City Hall, a very funny, uh, beautiful building. When they rebuilt it, they put that top floor on, and they've changed around the uh, spire and put a little bit there. And you would have seen something like this. This is about 1911. Judging by the Navy YMC behind us, we can actually see it in that photo. Um, so it's a little later than 1906. But it looks pretty similar today. Looking down Marlborough Street, probably from exactly where City Hall is, probably taken from City Hall, looking down that street. Um, redevelopment of course has changed the whole right hand side of this. But here you can see St. Paul's up in the uh, center, and to the left of that. It's really fairly well intact. They're very lucky. And then of course, my favorite part of the book is the first chapter and also the last chapter, which we read actors did a great job on because we get a really visual image of what he experienced coming into Newport. And as Newporters, or people who love Newport, we want to experience that. And this is what we see, the wonderful Army Navy YMCA. Uh, you don't want to know what they destroyed to build that. But at any rate, he talks about going into this little tiny store, which I remember as a store, and like I say, I'm 26. It was right across the street, the building is still there, I think it's Newport Tax now. And you can see the store there. I remember going in there and they had a dwelling unit above the store. That's been a lot of things now. So right down Broadway, right hand side of Broadway, with the exception of the Weaver block, which has burned a couple times, uh, the houses there are all pretty much the same. You know, we're pretty lucky to be seeing all this today. Now, the great thing about this is um, it's been hand colored. It's probably over in Germany. So we get this really great picture of Maybe a little gaudy, maybe it didn't look quite like that. Uh, but better than a black and white. And of course, the anchor of Washington Square, which thank God has not changed for over 200 years. Um, old State House and Common House. We would have grown into a construction site. 1926, this building was built. They built the front house next to us. And it's funny, in the book he doesn't mention this, but it's historical fiction. And it's great to hear all, all that he says. And you can't take it too seriously in the terms of what's happening around him because you can't make sense of anything. Where is Dear Bob? Where is Miss Cranston? So I've always wanted to know that question. I don't know. And it's funny, even in the book, I'm sure that when you read it, or if you have read it, uh, when Theophilus is called to Miss Cranston's, he leaves the street number blank. Uh, so once again, he gives a clue in the shadow of Trinity Church, but we don't know where. And you would have seen Washington Square. Now, this is an early photo of Washington Square, about the 1880s or so. Uh, and like John said, it has changed a lot. Washington Square was from 1880 to 1920s under a lot of different development. From the bank to the old colonial houses, it changes. You can see this happening with some architectural infill, taking down the old buildings. Here we see the old Hot Fellows Hall, which was burned in 1930, so a little bit after uh, the time frame of the book. And on the left hand side, you can see that nice three story house, which was eventually replaced in 1926, around that period, by the Savings Bank, which is still there today. So there's a lot of activity just in this one area of town, which is fabulous. Uh, and a couple pictures of what you would have seen. I love the Opera House, the Opera House especially in uh, Alice, as he comes into town on the trolley to meet this girl. Goes to the telegraph office, she gets on the trolley at the park, and the last, second to last chapter, he talks about how that's the last place he saw her as she broke down. <coughs> but it's actually two mile corner in Navy housing up there. Uh, so he would have come through all this area into this wonderful Ninth City Street, Fame Street full of businesses, full of signs and banners and advertising. And here we're actually uh, right beyond the Brick Alley Pub, which you can see there. We came to the other news and uh, 
Uh, everything on the left hand side is cross flawed. Uh, but the right hand side is still quite a bit of that architectural left. It ends up with a Y. And we're really lucky, the regular Y, not the immediately Y, but that is still there mostly. That weight has been taken down. Uh, it's now open again. Uh, but you can see he, this Y is there. As a matter of fact, in the movie, I'm sure you've all saw this one. It's a good movie. But uh, they have great interior images and shots of that before it was turned on like that. And he ends up going down Dame Street on his wheel to go around a 10 mile drive. And here we can see we're probably right in front of um, the arcade candy store. And that's what it looks like pretty much today. Matter of fact, the last photo, if you look down far enough, you can see that round clock sitting up there on top of what was uh, right beyond the uh, music hall cafe. And that's the late 70s, This is what we were talking about. John was talking about when they destroyed the redevelopment. And everybody did that, not just in the one. It was just a sign of the times. And this is the last photo of this series. It's in front of what is now the post office. Back then, um, this photo was taken at the customs house. The post office is made by about 1911. And you can see, looking at Fame Street, what it would have looked like. <coughs> then he goes past Fort Adams. Now, uh, Fort he was not an artilleryman. He was dealing with paper in an office, probably in a much different building. Um, but a lot of that structure is still left. We can still see a lot of this, uh, especially the hot seat, you know, the concrete batteries, the fort itself. It's there, uh, accessible to most anybody, in fact, just to walk around. It's part of the state park. And he eventually ends up at, in this case, it's a Davis, but back then it was the Fudlow House in 1926. Sadly, that is gone, uh, but the property is, you can still see the uh, ancillary built in there. And he would have sat there and looked out to Portugal, where that monument is, uh, even today. And across this view is here, it talks about the Agassi House. There's a picture of the Agassi House with this wonderful mumble of six lights that he sees uh, from that top floor. Beautiful A.J. Richardson house. To the beach that across gets every piece of garbage dumped in the shipping lanes comes floating in to Bailey's Beach. Okay. So, um, this is a little bit earlier, it looks like, but probably early 20s. And he ends up on, of course, I have to end this on Bellevue Ave because that's where a lot of it takes place. It takes place at the casino on Bellevue Ave. And with the exception of the shopping centers, it looks pretty much the same as it looked in 1926. The hotel was long gone by 1926, the Ocean House. So it would have been uh, empty lot. But the casino itself looks the same. Even the courts are still there. And this is a different layout, which you can see um, everything is still the same. Even Bellevue Map itself, beyond Memorial Boulevard. Now, the buildings over here on the right, have been destroyed, uh, not so much because of redevelopment, that was right after World War II. The buildings on the left hand side of the street, they were actually destroyed during redevelopment to make what we call Memorial Boulevard East. And the Travis Block. So a lot of what he saw still exists. He talked about sitting in the MK, looking out that front window. And he would have seen a huge construction site, one that was just finishing up, in the form of the Viking Hotel, which was also being built. A lot of these big brick buildings were being built right at the time of this story is placed. Uh, quite fascinating. And that's a large hotel at the time. And across the reading room, and there it is. The one for MK, sitting in that front window, having drinks with his friend Rip. And Talking about life. So, thank you back to you.
at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I, I promise. I could. I, I know, in a way, I gave a lecture on this uh, novel many years ago in the Redwood Library, thanks to George Herrick, sitting over here. George, thank you for putting up with another of my visits. I didn't know anything when I gave that lecture. <laughs> I was just taking over uh, my responsibility, but uh, I, I learned a great deal more about his life his works, and thanks to the wonderful Harper Collins publisher, and sometimes hear bad things about publishers. Well, I'm not complaining, I'm lucky. We put out new editions uh, early in the current century, and now we're redoing them, and that's what this celebration is, thanks to their extraordinary support. And uh, the great literary agent we have is sitting over here, too, uh, Barbara Hobinson. So, but you've all and maybe some of this is familiar to us. I, I'm just struck by my uncle who in 1935 said, after becoming a world famous novelist, said, I will never write another novel. It was a story carried in every newspaper in America. He said, I'm a playwright. Uh, I'm going to write plays. The novels of the omniscient voice of the novelist is not uh, appropriate to the age in which we live. Everything on the stage is cooperative. It's now, I'm never going to write another novel. I never trust an author. Uh, <laughs> after the Second World War, he wrote a fistulary novel. He keeps the omniscience. He said, it's just it's really a, a play. It's fiction. They called it a novel. The Eyes of March. Great work. And then years go by, and he's trying to write plays again. He goes to Douglas, Arizona for 20 months. This town, you, anybody been to Douglas? Uh, you, you go to Douglas, a uh, copper smelting town, belching one of the, not one word about the air quality in 20 months. Gets a little apart. Invites his soul, tries to write the plays he's writing, and suddenly he turns himself back into a novelist. And writes The Eighth Day, which wins the National Book Award. I mentioned this in the afterword. Now he's going again and ever to say, write your biography, uh, your autobiography, blah, blah, blah. No Wilder writes about a biography. The past has a lot of pain in it, but they'll tell stories about it. And he starts writing these fascinating things about his knowing Gertrude and being in Europe and blah, blah, blah. And he writes one about Newport. And out of that, these sketches. He gets a $10,000 advance for the eighth day, which sells over a million copies, wins the National Book Award. He's embarrassed by advances. It means the publisher has to go out and hawk the book, let the book sell in its own right, doesn't want to make it up. Well, they insisted, he said, we want another novel. He wrote in one year, he wrote this extraordinary novel. He gets an advance of $100,000. Biggest advance he ever got. He was willing to accept. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it earned it back, I must tell you. It earned it. I've had access to his IRS returns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quickly, three things, and uh, I want you all to engage with me on any point. Um, I've now lived with this book for 29 years through a wonderful edition of HarperCollins and this reissue, which we celebrate today. And I have come to realize when people say, what was your uncle like? I say, read Theophilus Nord. That's the uncle I knew. That's the it, uncle in this story. That's the uncle that, uh, you know, after he comes back from Douglas, Arizona. Uh, he's a storyteller and calls himself a fabulous. He's a vuncular as a dickhead. He had to fight that all his life. That's his father. That's in the genes. If he's writing me letters, you, you're a wilder. you got to be a bunkular indirect. <laughs> <laughs> and it can drive you crazy reading this novel. But also be human, be funny. And it's the wilder I knew. He would drop out of the sky. He's like a grasshopper. That's the way he described himself, based in Hamlin, Connecticut. He'd appear. Two or more than 200 days a year, he's traveling, or he's off. He's not back in his base, where he voted in New Haven, takes care of the family, and he's gone. He's a lonely traveler. His 
eyes on the wall, reading a thousand faces, which is a theme that runs throughout this novel. And he always gets in trouble wherever he goes. He stays too long. He gets to know people, and they love him. And they reveal things about themselves. He learns things about all sorts of people. And eventually, and like Theophilus North, I'm often asked, how do you deal with the end of the book where he suddenly becomes shaman-like and he's got electricity, you know, his hand, touch your hand, you see. You can turn this guy into a better architectural style. Fewer the collecting instinct. <laughs> They're playing the Hawthorne game. They're endlessly 
throwing around the self-contained, centered question, where did my imperfections creep in? <laughs> and then it goes on. Uh, that's Theophilus Norm for Wilder, speaking to his son. That could have been in the book. It's probably it's there somewhere. The book is very emo emotionally moving to me, and I hope the readers uh, know if you when you all read it, I hope you will and reread it. It's deeply autobiographical. All of Wilder is, but it's down deep. Yes. You agree? <laughs> you agree. But well, I'm intrigued by it. He's such a traveler. But in the book, it's as if he spent a century in the world. He's waking in beds in the place, in, like, in every brain. Well, his whole life he has spoke four languages all over the place. But the point is that, that this town, community allowed him at the end of his life when he was very sick to write in one year a book which I agree with you has been long dismissed as sort of entertaining after the eighth day. It's much more serious. This is a very serious book. And the autobiographical elements I'm going to pass over because I don't really have time for questions. But I assure you it's just tongue so much stuff there that I've come to feel that yes, he may be playing with this idea of his dead brother, writing the life of his imagined dead brother. And he may be suffering from a, a condition that psychiatrists like to write about before they change their mind about it, which they often do in the next uh, directory of disease. <laughs> uh, that he had some guilt for having killed a brother. Possibly. It's an element possible. But there's so much of autobiographical that are buried at one level that I almost feel like it's Thornton Wilder writing about Thornton Wilder, not necessarily about the dead brother. And it's very moving for me personally because there's a lot about my father. There's details about him. It's not just the fact that he played tennis uh, on the courts. He was a very good tennis player. He's under court at Wimbledon. He uh, but he hasn't been the first world war, not only driving an ambulance in France, but also the Balkans. It's that kind of thing. And there's an extraordinary, to show you in the weeds, just briefly, I promised to come out of the weeds. He mentions the name Walter Lauer. How many people are familiar with Walter Lauer? Here is the great, <coughs> the Minister, everyone, the great Kierkegaard scholar at Princeton, who also was abroad in Italy for many years, who counseled Amos Wilder, my father, on his thesis, and who Thornton Wilder would visit when he was at Princeton, beginning his great work on the biography of Kierkegaard, an amazing figure. His name is there, the church he served is there, and it, it doesn't say he visited it. And there's a whole chapter on after the, uh, dealing, dealing with a beautiful chapter about uh, uh, a young lad, Nino, who loses his legs. And he restores him to humanity. And he talks about, you know, about visiting the hospitals after the First World War, and where he went to, to the was in New Jersey dealing with the, to the injured from the war. That actually happened after the Second World War. He's moved it around. But he did it, and that whole chapter, I'm sure, is totally based on his experience in going on. And it goes on, I could go on and on and on, there's all sorts of stuff. Finally, John Fulton, his neighbor in Hammond, Connecticut, who's the great brain surgeon at Yale, uh, with a huge Harvard uh, mass general background, an amazing figure, who was a book collector. <coughs> I think he, sure, is the core of that figure, uh, Dr. Bosco. Now, I could go on and on. I'd like to just end and then come back to some points that, uh, that you said, uh, Sarah, about Thornton Wilder and Theophilus North in the future. Um, here we are with the, re, the republication of this book by, by Harper Collins. I, Thornton Wilder is being revisited by people, but it's, it starts with always our town. So famous. And the Bridge of St. Louis Ray, 
the castor oil you had to read in high school. <laughs> Maybe we could do 
questions downstairs? Just talk to each other. But two questions downstairs. Could we do two questions here, or do you want us downstairs? I'll do it. What? The, two questions, sure. Two questions. I love the title of the author's door, and I was always just, I just hated it when the title of the book was changed to Mr. North. Yeah. And why did that happen? For how long did Mr. North exist on bookshelves? Um, that was just a movie. It was just a movie. It was very bad. Do you know anything about the publishing world? I They like to sell books. They like to sell books. And when a big movie comes out, you know, they ain't allowed that. They made the change. Barbara, I'm sure, perfectly all right in that edition after it ran out. Thank <laughs> you. 